Hello, and welcome to AdvancingMentalHealth.org's video channel. I'm Jeff Baker. In this video segment, we'll be spending about 20 minutes taking a detailed look at the chemical imbalance theory, which says that mental disorders are caused by chemical imbalances in the brain and that psychiatric medications correct those imbalances. First, we'll briefly go through the history of the chemical imbalance theory, and then we'll look at the scientific findings of a number of today's leading psychiatric researchers. If you believe, like 85% of the general public, that mental disorders are most likely caused by chemical imbalances in the brain, you'll really want to hear what these leading researchers have to say about it. It'll open the door to better outcomes for you and anyone you know. Okay, let's get started. Keep in mind, this video is geared for the general public. Some of you will be familiar with the terminology being used, and some won't. So, as we go through this, I'll be explaining some things from time to time and try and make sure everybody who's watching can understand what's being said. Now, first, it's important you have a little history on the chemical imbalance theory to put things into context. The theory first started to gain popularity in the 1960s. It's based on the idea that mental disorders are caused by either too much or too little of certain chemicals in the brain called neurotransmitters. The main ones are serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. For example, most of us have heard the story that depression is caused by low serotonin in the brain. Throughout the 1960s, more was learned about the effects that psychiatric medications had on the brain and also about neurotransmitters in general. Toward the end of the 1960s, the chemical imbalance theory stirred up the hope that we had finally cracked the code about what causes mental disorders and also how to cure them using psychiatric medications. So in the late 60s, the psychiatric research community set out in earnest to prove that the chemical imbalance theory was indeed true. And for about 15 years, from the late 60s to the early 80s, at least 100 major research studies were done trying to prove the chemical imbalance theory. Many of these studies were called monoamine depletion studies. Now, for those of you not familiar with neurotransmitters, they're divided into groups like peptides, amino acids, and monoamines. The main neurotransmitters having to do with the chemical imbalance theory, including serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, are in the monoamine group. The hypothesis of the monoamine depletion studies is simple. If people are depressed because the serotonin in their brain is low, if you took a person who's never had to deal with depression and dramatically reduced the amount of serotonin in their brain, they should get depressed. And in the many, many monoamine depletion studies done, not one normal person got depressed when the serotonin in their brain was dramatically reduced. These monoamine depletion studies and a number of other types of studies that also had negative outcomes pretty much knocked the wind out of the chemical imbalance theory. And finally, in 1984, the National Institute of Mental Health, which is the largest and most prestigious mental health research organization in the world, published this finding in the American Journal of Psychiatry. They concluded that Elevations or decrements in the functions of serotonergic systems are not likely to be associated with depression. And even in the late 80s, when the introduction of Prozac gave the theory some new life, by the end of the 1990s, the new research only confirmed these original findings were indeed correct. From that point forward, 
the psychiatric research community left behind the chemical imbalance theory and moved on to other possibilities. Now I know for some of you, that fact might be hard to believe seeing how today about 85% of the general public still think that mental disorders are caused by chemical imbalances in the brain. And there's a reason that that story has been perpetuated, which we'll talk about later and also take up in detail in our next video. But for now, in the interest of being able to produce better outcomes for people who are really suffering from mental and emotional distress, treatment paths should be based on scientific facts. What today's leading psychiatric researchers say about the chemical imbalance theory is vital to consider when we're trying to help people. Listen to what they have to say, and then make your own decisions. Is that fair enough? Okay, let me just say first that these days you can go on the internet and you can find information to support any viewpoint you could possibly dream up about anything. In order to know information is true, you have to first establish that its source is credible. So in light of that, we'll take some time and examine each of these psychiatric researchers' credentials and then we'll see what they have to say about the chemical imbalance theory. And we encourage you to also check out these researchers for yourselves. The first researcher is Dr. Kenneth Kendler. Dr. Kendler is the director of the Virginia Institute of Psychiatric and Behavioral Genetics at Virginia Commonwealth University. He's one of the highest cited psychiatric researchers in the world Citations from his research are used in many textbooks and papers that are written, etc. He also served on the task force in various work groups that revised the DSM-3 and created the DSM-4 and the DSM-5. For those of you not familiar, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's considered to be the Bible of diagnostic tools for psychiatrists. It was created by the American Psychiatric Association. I'd call Dr. Kendler a credible source. In the American Journal of Psychiatry, he published this finding about the chemical imbalance theory. He said, we have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders and have not found them. Next is Dr. Ronald Pies. He's been the editor-in-chief of the Psychiatric Times, which is one of the main publications of the American Psychiatric Association. He's a clinical professor of psychiatry at Tufts University and SUNY Upstate Medical University. He's a lecturer on psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, another credible source. In an article, published in the Psychiatric Times, he concludes, the chemical imbalance notion was always kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. The legend of the chemical imbalance should be consigned to the dustbin of ill-informed and malicious caricatures. Our next researcher is Dr. Stephen Stahl. Dr. Stahl has held faculty positions at Stanford University, University of California at Los Angeles, Institute of Psychiatry in London, and the Institute of Neurology in London. He was the Executive Director of Clinical Neurosciences at Merck Neuroscience Research Center, and currently he's an adjunct professor of psychiatry at University of California at San Diego. Another very credible source. Now, in Essential Psychopharmacology, which is a college textbook written by Dr. Stahl, he concludes, there is no clear and convincing evidence that monoamine deficiency accounts for depression. That is, there is no real monoamine deficit. Next is Dr. Joseph Glenmullen. He's a graduate of Harvard Medical School, and he's also a clinical instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, a credible source. In his book, Prozac Backlash, published by Simon & Schuster, 
He concludes, in recent decades, we have had no shortage of alleged biochemical imbalances for psychiatric conditions. Diligent, though these attempts have been, not one has been proven. Quite the contrary. In every instance where such an imbalance was thought to have been found, it was later proven false. The next researcher is Dr. Eric Nessler. He's the chairman of the Department of Neuroscience and director of the Friedman Brain Institute at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. He's on the National Advisory Mental Health Council for the National Institute of Mental Health, a very credible source. Dr. Nessler published the following finding in the American Journal of Psychiatry. He says, there is little evidence to implicate true deficits in serotonergic, which is serotonin, noradrenergic, which is norepinephrine or dopaminergic neurotransmission in the pathophysiology or what causes depression. Next is Dr. Stephen Hyman. Now currently, Dr. Hyman is the director of the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. He was provost of Harvard University from 2001 to 2011. And from 1996 to 2001, he served as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. A very credible source. Now, something else that needs to be understood is that another part of the chemical imbalance story, just like depression is caused by low serotonin, is that schizophrenia and psychosis are caused by excess amounts of dopamine in the brain. Dr. Hyman, along with Dr. Nessler, published the following finding in their book, Molecular Neuropharmacology. He says there is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. Now, I think you'll agree that all these findings are absolutely clear and definitive about the chemical imbalance theory. And please, check out these researchers for yourselves. The fatal flaw in the chemical imbalance theory was how it was originally conceived. Real medical cures mostly start with the discovery of a cause for the disease or condition. For example, the strep infection, at one time very dangerous, was found to be caused by the streptococcus bacteria. An antibiotic was developed to kill the bacteria, and now there's a cure. But in the case of the chemical imbalance theory, no cause was ever discovered for any mental disorder. The theory was always based on trying to understand how the psychiatric medications worked. The idea was that if these medications made some people feel better, if we understood what they do, maybe we could learn what causes mental disorders. As a result, for the last 30 to 40 years, the construct or the way we think about mental disorders has been based largely on psychopharmacology, or in other words, psychiatric drugs, and trying to understand how they work. Let me give you an example. It was thought that if a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is an antidepressant like Prozac or Zoloft, if these medications increased the amount of serotonin in the brain and at the same time made some people feel better, then it was thought that depression must be caused by low amounts of serotonin. And as we've shown, no scientific evidence has ever been found to support that theory. Dr. Thomas Insel weighs in on this. Now, Dr. Insel was the director of the National Institute of Mental Health for 14 years from 2002 to 2016. The National Institute of Mental Health is the largest psychiatric research organization in the world with a $1.5 billion annual budget. 
Here's what Dr. Insel had to say. We, all, we talk about um, mental disorders as brain disorders, but what does that really mean? I mean, what does that do in terms of diagnosis or treatment, and how does it change the way we think about autism, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar illness? And the answer to that question is still evolving. The fact is that the constructs underlying how we think of these disorders have largely been based in the last three or four decades on psychopharmacology, and it's been this, I think, mistaken belief that if a um, serotonin reuptake inhibitor helps people with depression, then people with depression must be a quart low in serotonin. We really don't have evidence that would support that notion, and everything we know about how the brain works says that it's not only chemical but electrical transmission that, that is essential. So, assuming all these scientific findings we've shared are valid, and the chemical imbalance theory of mental disorders is not true, that means that depression is not caused by low serotonin, and that excesses or deficits in neurotransmitter levels in the brain do not cause mental disorders. This also means that psychiatric medications do not correct chemical imbalances or normalize brain function. So what then do psychiatric medications actually do? Well, Dr. Insel also weighs in on this. In the Journal of Clinical Investigation, Dr. Insel published the following finding. He said, for too many people, antipsychotics and antidepressants are not effective. And even when they are helpful, they reduce symptoms without eliciting recovery. This brings us to the curse. Most biological research in psychiatry has been focused on understanding how the psychiatric medications work. If the medications were curative, this might be revealing. But these medications, at best, ameliorate or lessen symptoms. So psychiatric medications are not curative. They don't correct or normalize chemical imbalances in the brain. Essentially, at best, they can provide symptomatic relief for some people with extreme mental and emotional pain, the same way medications like morphine or Oxycontin do for physical pain. The false idea that mental disorders are caused by chemical imbalances and that psychiatric medications correct those imbalances has been perpetuated by design mostly to bolster the sale of psychiatric medications. We'll be covering this in detail in our next video segment. Now it's time to take the chemical imbalance story off the table. It's time doctors stop telling their patients that they're feeling depressed or disturbed because the serotonin in their brain is low and the medications will build it up so they feel better. It's time to start being honest about the fact that we really don't know what causes mental disorders. And it's time to start admitting to patients that psychiatric medications are not curative but only can provide symptomatic relief for some people. Being honest about what science has shown will, in fact, enable many more people who seek help for mental and emotional distress to be cared for more effectively and enjoy better outcomes. Thanks. We hope this has been helpful, and we'll see you next time.